Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, members and fellows of the institution, friends and family. I'm delighted to see you all here. My late father advised me always never to seek a compliment, a promotion or an award. So I never have. And when I receive them, I've been totally surprised. None so more than on this occasion, as Ian will tell you. Throughout my career, I've been very fortunate to work with amazingly inspirational and talented people. Some of them older, some younger than me, mostly engineers, but not all of them. They've shared my passion for design, my commitment to quality, and my desire to make a positive difference in people's lives. I'd like to mention just three. Martin Manning, who taught me the importance of technical rigor and believing in the maths. Peter Guthrie, who founded Redar and then the Masters of Engineering for Sustainable Development at Cambridge. Both have been, been important parts of my life. And finally, Justin Evans, who was my first boss at, at Arup. And our paths crossed later when he offered to mentor me as I grew my business. I couldn't have done any of what I've done without them, or many of you. You know who you are, and I'm delighted that, you, that so many of you are here tonight. Thank you all for being part of my journey. It's an extraordinary honor to be awarded the gold medal. I feel like I'm treading in the footsteps of giants. People like Felix Candela and Ted Happold, and of course, Jack Zuntz and Ovarup, who inspired me in the first place to become a structural engineer because I wanted to design amazing structures. When I first worked for Arup, I worked for Justin Evans, who worked for Martin Manning, who worked for Jack Zuntz. Jack Zuntz either was God or worked for God. I've never been quite sure, but having had lunch with him last week, I can tell you he's still immortal and as wise as ever. Ove was awarded the gold medal in 1973 for his extraordinary contribution to structural engineering. But I think his key achievement was probably founding a firm founded in his philosophy of technical excellence and social usefulness. It's now 14,000 strong and still independent, and it's created no less than eight gold medalists, including me. And Arup has provided a hugely fertile ground for me to grow and develop throughout my career, which has spanned design, disasters, and development. They've been very generous, letting me take very abrupt leaves of absence to go and work for various humanitarian agencies and UN agencies in the aftermath of disasters, and also to let me spend time as a part-time fellow at Sydney Sussex Cambridge, which gave me a bit of space to think rather than do, um, and research into post-disaster shelter. And then, as Ian mentioned, importantly, uh, they supported my proposal 10 years ago to set up the international development business. I simply felt that the biggest ch challenges facing society were and still are urbanization, increasing population, the finite resource of one planet, climate change and poverty. Together, they make a challenging cocktail. And that those challenges are felt most acutely in the developing world. I just simply felt there was an opportunity to reach out and provide the technical expertise in the built environment to humanitarian development organizations who just don't come from the same background as ourselves. Most of them have built their careers helping people in places like rural Africa. But over the past 10 years, these same challenges have fueled a global debate. And I think that's what matters today and is going to matter for the next 30 years. They, that debate has reached a consensus in the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but also the Sendai Agreement, which specifically focuses on disasters, the Paris Declaration, which focuses on climate change, and the promise of the new urban agenda. My view at the moment is that the world's decided that what we need is safe, sustainable, inclusive, and resilient communities. The question for us as structural engineers is how do we contribute to this global agenda? My starting point for thinking about this was what we do primarily as structural engineers, which is try and design safe structures. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized there were a number of other things involved 
in being a structural engineer and, and the other issues that have, have shaped what I've done over the last 30 years. And really, what I want to talk to, about tonight is my career and where that's led me in thinking about where structural engineering might go in the future. Ovarup felt that our immediate priority was to satisfy the criteria for sound, lasting, and economical structures. And certainly when I joined Arup, I wasn't aware of any of these big global issues. All I was worried about was making buildings stand up. I was slightly confused. The first thing I was asked to design was a bus shelter. I said, how? Justin said, BS5950. <laughs> I said, what's that? And he said, oh, no, you didn't go to Cambridge, did you? <laughs> it was the architect for the bus shelter was Norman Foster. So I didn't exactly start in a totally humble place. But the priority was thinking about what loads this bus shelter might actually have to carry um, and trying to make it as elegant as possible. I swiftly realized that engineering wasn't just about making things stand up. It was about form as well as function. It was about making sure that the buildings we designed enhanced and fitted in with the environment. These are two where I was very lucky early in my career to, to work on some smallish buildings which I could actually see from the beginning to the end of the project. This is the Hat Hill uh, Sculpture Park in Sussex and the Ucker Centrum um, in Europe. And both of them were exciting because we were trying to minimize the structure as much as possible and use renewable or recyclable materials. But all of us as structural engineers at some point strive for what Nervi referred to as that esoteric emotion, beauty. I think the closest that I've ever come to this was my part in the Société Générale roof um, in Paris, where we refined the structure and ended up persuading the client that he should build it out of tapered, triangular, stainless steel hollow sections. Clearly money was no object on that particular project. In the early 90s, I moved to Hong Kong to go and work on Shep Black Hawk Airport with several people from the Arab office who I'm delighted to see here tonight. It was an amazing two years. And I've looked back on this project as something where I, which I call engineered architecture. The reason for that is because the architectural concept was incredibly strong. It was simply to have one structural form or a very limited structural palette through the whole building. These 36 meter span lattice roof, roof trusses, virandil mullions supporting a glass wall which varied in height from four meters to 22 meters, and a concrete rib slab. The problem was that that pallet had to be applied for every single function in the building. And an airport has a lot of functions going from the baggage hall through the concourses. And so effectively, looking back on this, what we did was analyze this and engineer this iteratively for about two years. Of course, the form of construction for the roof was possible because of computers, um, because the computers could actually analyze the concrete shells and understand how they, where the forces were flowing when they were um, deforming under loads. But it was more complicated than that because the, ro the, uh, the roof trusses sat on cantilever columns coming off the concrete frame. And those columns were then framed into one or two stories of concrete building below. So in fact, it was all about the relative stiffness of the columns and the roof in terms of whether the whole building worked. It's what now I'd refer to as a complex system where you change something in one part of the building and it actually changes something somewhere else. But the biggest issue was computers then weren't very clever. They were cleverer than us, but they weren't as clever as they are today. We didn't have PCs on our desk. And in fact, what we got was one Sun Microsystems computer until we called up London and said, please send us another one because we were working 24 hour shifts. I thought about this in the context of the conversations going on about digital transformation and wondered if in a digital world, what would have been different? We would have done it faster, but would we have done it better? Sometimes really good structural engineering takes time and thought. It takes endless iterations. And as my colleague Andy Foster told me when I asked him on this project, how come his designs were always better than mine? He said, look at my waste paper bin. 
he iterated them, you know, one after the other. I had an amazing two years in Hong Kong and learned a great deal. Um, when I came back, I started work, I went via Germany briefly, and then I came back to London and was asked to work on this project, which is the Osaka Maritime Museum. The architect's concept was a ship in a bottle. The problem was that bottle is in Osaka, which is on the same latitude as Cyprus and Atlanta, i.e. it was a greenhouse, a ship in a greenhouse. The structural engineering was about the purest form you could ever get, and it was a complete joy to engineer. An 80 meter diameter lattice shell. Um, the geometry for it, um, we made, we created by, by actually, I actually wrote a Fortran program. Apparently my Fortran was not very good, but it worked. Um, and the trick was actually creating a geometry that could take square panes of glass, because that would actually keep the cost reasonable, um, reasonably low. We finessed this structure. We designed it for earthquakes um, and tsunamis. But while we were working flat out to achieve that form of elegance, our building services colleagues were busy filling up the basement with air conditioning plant. We found a solution that helped things by putting fritted, uh, perforated metal sheets between the glass layers, which gives it that sort of varying appearance of solidity and transparency. And I was delighted to be part of this project, even more delighted in 2001, when it won an Institution of Structural Engineers Special Award. And I think looking back, that's the sort of peak of technical ele ele excellence and perhaps elegance um, that I ever contributed to in my career. But the fact that it was a greenhouse and the fact that it had all that air conditioning in really, really bothered me. Because while this building was being designed, the sustainab sustainability discussion was gaining traction. And I started to question is this really what I wanted to do? Design spectacular buildings, working with some of the greatest architects in the world? Or could I do something different? And I was thinking a lot about all of these big issues to do with the number of people on the planet and the fact that we only have one planet. Happily, a solution came along with the Heritage Lottery Fund, which provided a different avenue of work altogether, which was refurbishing and redeveloping grade two listed buildings. The Royal Geographical Society in Kensington Gore, I have particular affection for because I won it with a young architectural practice called Studio Downey when we're up against some really stiff competition. And I won't forget the interview when we saw some much more senior Arab colleagues going in and out with some much more famous architects. <laughs> the building was extremely difficult. The thing that drove it was actually the economic case. What we realized is that actually, however good a building we built, the Royal Geographical Society would go bust unless they could continue to put a marquee in their garden every summer and every Christmas and host parties. That in revenue stream was critical for the sustainability of the institution. So we came up with a great idea, which was to widen the terrace and put all their priceless maps under the terrace in an environmentally controlled environment and create a new room but socialising on Kensington Gore. The National Portrait Gallery was even more challenging. There we had to work really closely with building services engineers, and I finally realised what they actually do, because I had, to, I had to create a lot of structural surgery on this Grade two listed building to weave the, the conditioning plant, plants through. They kept asking for holes. And they didn't really understand that if you had a grade two listed building, like where you could make those holes and how big those holes were was actually quite a tricky challenge. The main bit of the National P uh, Portrait Gallery building sits within a courtyard between the original building and the National Gallery itself. And we weren't allowed to put any loads on the existing structure. So the whole approach was a sort of look no hands. And I remember the design review and I explained the structure very carefully. And I said, look, there's a column here and a column over there about the length of this room. And the side of the second floor gallery is a story height truss. And the first floor is hung off the second floor. And then there's a little sort of lean to on the top, which is a cafe, which sits on the third floor. There was a silence and someone said, why? <laughs> 
It was a good learning moment. I realized that the word why probably is really important and something that we as engineers don't ask enough. We get very, very busy about what we're doing and how we're doing it. But then, why are we doing it? And is it worthwhile and meaningful to do? The second bit of Ove's philosophy, which is not in his definition of the quality of structures, refers to social usefulness. A lot of discussion goes on within Arab about what does social usefulness really mean. I found out when, in 1994, when I came back to my desk and I found a post-it note stuck to my telephone. We had telephones then. And it said, call Red R. I thought they just wanted my signature because I was then a trustee of Red R and a signature on, signatory on the checks. But they didn't. They wanted me to go to Rwanda. The genocide had broken up out a week before and refugees were pouring across the border. And so I found myself a week later flying over Banaka refugee camp. And this is the photo, I apologize for the quality, that I took from the window. We had cameras then too, not iPhones. 250,000 people had arrived within three days. Overnight, it was the second biggest city in Tanzania. And I watched the process of urbanization happen in front of my eyes over the, last, the next few weeks as humanitarian agencies tried to create order, providing roads and basic services to ensure that everyone had access to basic shelter, food, water. And this is what Banaka looked like several months later. The other thing that I saw um, very vividly was the trail of refugees, like an ant trail, going through the camp to the only water source that existed, which was a lake. And over the course of that first week, the lake just went down and got browner as Oxfam and various other NGOs tried very, very hard to set up water treatment plants on the edge before all the water had run out. There was a forest on the edge of the camp when I arrived, and when I left, it had walked backwards by several hundred meters. What I realized I was seeing was a microcosm of what was going on on our planet, where seven and a half billion people were consuming the resources of 1.7 planets a year. The third thing that I realized when I was in Bonaco was just how incredibly important infrastructure is for distributing resources and how incredibly important shelter is for protecting people from the environment, just the sun and the rain. And that actually not much happens without buildings. You need distribution centers for food. You need storage centers for food. You need feeding centers. You need hospitals. There wasn't a great deal to, of material available to build buildings out of and we had to make do with what we could find. Most of the buildings that I built were out of eucalyptus poles, which could be bought locally. Um, some of them arrived in pallets, usually with missing parts, and that required quite a lot of creativity and ingenuity to make sure that they, they went up safely. When I came back, I was interviewed by the Telegraph, and at the end of the interview, I was asked, you're so brave to have done what you've done. And I did see some pretty horrendous things out there. And I also got cerebral malaria, which wasn't much fun. But actually my response was, I feel lucky. It wasn't the response she was expecting and asked why. And I said simply because I've chosen a career where I can make a difference. Most people see horrors on their television set and all they can do is send money off to go and help, enable other people to help. But I realized actually I'd chosen a career where I actually had a really practical, tangible skill that I could use and use for good. Returning to the UK, I thought hard about what I really minded about and felt that really what I cared about most was not just technical excellence, it was this bit about social usefulness or social purpose. What I wanted to do with my career is use my skills to reduce vulnerability and improve the quality of life, particularly for the most disadvantaged people in society. And I felt it was really important to do that in a way that was sustainable because I couldn't get over what I'd seen in Rwanda, 
What was important is using limited resources wisely. And perhaps that's what really Ove meant by a lasting and economical structure was actually one which it wasn't just about the affordability or the finances of the structure. It was actually we need to be economical with materials um, as, well as, our pop, as, as well as our budgets. All of this is really speaks directly to the sustainability agenda. And I tend to use this definition of sustainability by Raf Bicknesse from the Green Building Council in London because it's nice and simple. It's simply that sustainability is about ecology, economy, and equity. And we actually have to try and work that out, how we are going to manage to use all the resources in the world to cater for all the needs of everyone in the world, not just this generation, but also future generations. All of this, of course, was debated in 1992 at the Rio Summit on Sustainable Development, and the principles of sustainable development were pretty, have been pretty well established ever since. In the, um, towards the end of the 1990s, the British government set, uh, issued a report called Quality of Life. And the Quality of Life report provided an immense opportunity, in my view, because it actually meant that public sector buildings had to align with sustainability principles. I looked for opportunities with local authorities, <coughs> deprived boroughs in London like Tower Hamlets and Merton and Newham, to find public sector buildings that were being built where we could combine good design with these briefs that were trying to help disadvantaged people. The Shore Start Nursery, the Tamworth Shore Start Nursery in South London is a good example of this. Designed with John McCaslin and partners, we worked really hard to make the most minimal structure possible. It only uses two steel sections and the whole structure was erected in two days. Those same principles I applied to a kindergarten in Ghana. There's no reason why we can't approach things. Good design can't translate to different geographies. And there we really pushed hard for a really modular structure with natural ventilation and renewable materials that could be built by local people, primarily so that it could be maintained by local people, because that's actually the most important thing in terms of trying to get to a lasting structure. We also captured, de designed it as a prototype, and captured what it, the, the drawings in, it, we drew them in color in three dimensions in a, in a really big book. It's like two telephone directories. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to be able to optimize the design and replicate it. Um, already 12 schools have been built, and what's really exciting is that this last year, the Minister of Education um, has announced that they want to build thousands of schools across the country and wants to adopt this as a prototype building. Back in London, there were other opportunities in Whitechapel. Really innovative briefs were emerging from certain parts of the of certain boroughs. The idea store were conceived as the next generation of public libraries. The idea was to pioneer a new approach to the provision of information services and support lifelong learning. They were located on congested brownfield sites close to supermarkets and housing estates. And the idea was the idea store would provide go-to resource for kids wanting to read or borrow a video. The principle was it doesn't matter what you read as long as you read. But also for older people so they could learn IT skills or for people seeking unemployment so they could simply pop in and do their CV. There's several of these in East London but this is the flagship one on Whitechapel. I worked on this with David Ajay, Ajay, who was then a little known architect, but nevertheless at the time it was quite obvious he was going to go far. He, the, the superstructure was relatively straightforward and we had a concrete frame um, in order to make sure that we could do the whole thing with passive cooling and that was important because of running costs. The really difficult bit was on the ground. The site had been transferred for one pound, and it was the worst site I've ever worked on. Every unforeseen circumstance, ranging from unexploded ordnance to contamination, had come out. But the one we didn't foresee was that the crossrail alignment would change a week after we let the contract to the contractor. And perhaps one of the bits of engineering I'm proudest of is the work that we did at high speed over four months to totally redesign the foundations for, so that the crossrail tunnel could pass underneath. Happily, it did, and the building survived. 
You'll see later on that I have a passion for schools and education, which I think is the foundation of society, and the Academy's program simply provided an opportunity to design new schools. This is, these photos are the Harris Academy in South London, again a John McCaslin building, again a very difficult site, with contamination, noisy roads, congestion. I've never seen such an awful school as the school that existed on that site before, and I've never been so proud of a building as I have this one. Several years after it was completed, I picked up the Evening Standard on the way home. The A-level results were being announced, and there was an article with a picture of a student from Harris Academy who got A-stars at A-level and a place at Cambridge University to read engineering. Those are the kinds of projects that I think make being a structural engineer worthwhile. But in 2004, the tsunami struck, and my life took a different turn yet again. I didn't really feel like rushing out to the tsunami. I'd been working on in post-disaster situations on and off for the last 10 years, and I thought that other people who were younger could probably go and do it. And then I got a call saying, would I go and work from DFID to say, would I go and work for the United Nations to head up the shelter initiative for the whole country? They asked me what I'd need to make a decision. And I said, a terms of reference would probably be a good starting point. <laughs> so I went home and came in the next morning and the terms of reference were there. I think very occasionally in life, you read a job description and realize that actually that job description says only you. I realized that what they wanted was somebody who got experience working with humanitarian organizations um, and therefore understood local communities and how challenging it is to work in those environments. But they also wanted someone who could work with the government because the United Nations role is to be the counterpart of the government. And the third thing they needed is someone who was pretty well organized um, and could actually manage a shelter response across the country. And the scale of that program was enormous. 31,000 people had died in Sri Lanka, but over 500,000 people were displaced and homeless. A huge amount of effort had gone on in the first couple of three weeks to distribute tents, some more suitable than others for a trop tropical cr climate. But the real issue is that it was going to take years to rebuild people's homes. What was going to happen in the interim? When I was at Cambridge as a part-time fellow, Tom Corsellis was also working in the engineering department, and he had pioneered research into what's called transitional shelter. It's transitional, not temporary, because it's either shelter that you can move from one place to another as refugees are on the move, or it's shelter that actually fills a gap in time before people find their way back to decent housing. It was because of that, and because I'd been working with him on some research there, that I'd received this call. It wasn't as random as though it might sound. And what, I, what he knew that I was aware of was that esoteric and inventive creations, which a lot of engineers and architects come up with in these situations, although very interesting to the design professions, and they feature quite a lot in architectural magazines, are of little value whatsoever to disaster vi victims. What was needed was a strategic approach that actually meant that everyone, all those 500,000 people, actually had a shelter. And the really tricky bit was making sure they had something roughly the same. Because if they had, if, if you gave really amazing and big shelters to what, people in one part of the country and less good ones to somewhere else, you were likely to actually compound the tensions that existed within the country already. The answer was a performance-based specification. Sounds very grand. It was about eight lines long. It was based on the sphere humanitarian standards and basically said that every shelter had to be a certain size, 17 and a half meters squared, which is the recommendation for a, five, a family of five. It set out that it needed to be ventilated, what was necessary in terms of doors and windows. But as you can see from these pictures, the way it was interpreted was totally different. It depended on the capacity of the organizations building them. It depended on what local materials were available or what they could import. But gradually, over six months, shelter after shelter after shelter sprung up. In the end, we'd constructed 60,000 shelters in six months, 
By the time I left Sri Lanka in September that year, just before the rains began, there was nobody living in tents. And what was even more exciting was actually beginning to see people rebuild their lives. Those shelters were there to help them carry out their household duties, to resume their livelihoods, to raise their families. And this smile on this lady's face, it was a photo I took just after I'd given her the key to her shelter, really says it all. This, for her, was the beginning of recovery. But the road to recovery is extremely long. And it's really in the process of reconstruction that we as structural engineers can make an enormous difference and where we're sorely needed. This phrase, build back better, was coined by President Clinton, who has made the UN special envoy for the tsunami. The question, though, is what does better mean? Interestingly enough, for most people who come from a development or humanitarian background, and they come from social sciences backgrounds, the better all related to what we might refer to as soft issues, about better communities, better education, more cohesion, what was forgotten is the fact that Build Back Better surely has to start with structural safety. And when I turned up in Aceh 15 months after the tsunami to do an evaluation for the Disasters Emergency Committee of the work of 11 NGOs, I was staggered to see buildings, houses, lots and lots of houses under construction. But you could just see looking at them, you didn't even have to do a FEMA assessment that they were unsafe. It was unconfined masonry, plain reinforcement bars, links that weren't closed. And it was just, you, you could just see that what was actually happening was another disaster waiting to happen. And the even more extraordinary thing is that everyone was so obsessed by the impact of the tsunami, and that's not surprising because it was absolutely staggering, the devastation there. It was actually no one had really made the connection that the tsunami was caused by an earthquake in the first place. And probably the earthquake had damaged a lot of buildings, but the tsunami had washed the evidence away. And actually putting that kind of knowledge into the debate began to change the way that people started to do things. And Ziggy Lubkowski and myself ran around lobbying the UN, lobbying the Bureau of Reconstruction to say, you've got to take this seriously. And you might ask why? Why weren't there engineers there? And the answer is, I don't really know. There were a few often very young engineers in charge of big programs under enormous pressure. But Teddy Byrne is one of the most respected seismic engineers in the world, and he's Indonesian. But he was hundreds of miles away in Jakarta. And it got me thinking that perhaps one of the most significant contributions we can make as structural engineers is actually making our knowledge more readily available and more accessible. The other thing that was really important was also recognizing that there were skills that were really important there. This elderly gentleman in the picture is smiling because I found him building a house. I realized he was very good at building a house, but I also realized he was very old and felt that he'd be better off sitting in the shade under a tree teaching other people to build a house, which is what he did. And this is, a, this, this is just a, a connection detail of the vernacular construction that they use there, which actually is a seismic detail. But as this elderly gentleman told me, that knowledge is simply disappearing. It's interesting to put that together with the fact that the articles that have been going around over the last couple of weeks about the shortage of sand in the world. Vietnam has brought out a law now making extraction of sand illegal without a license. And if you pour through the 17 sustainable development goals and the fine print, it emphasizes the fact that if we're going to achieve the rates of urbanization over the next 20 years, we need to be doing much more with vernacular construction because we simply can't do it all with concrete. But there are other ways to build back better, and one of them is to actually influence the environment in which construction takes place by having proper regulations, codes and standards and ensuring those are enforced. You'd be amazed how in many, many countries around the world, either the codes and standards don't exist or they're horribly out of date or there just isn't the capacity to enforce them. Um, Hurricane Ike struck the Turks and Caicos Islands in 2008 and I'm horrified to see that they have been struck again this year 
Um, it's devastating, the damage that's caused by hurricanes. Uh, some of it is due to environmental planning, but a lot of it is just simply due to poor quality construction. Really basic things like J-hooks to hold down roofs um, would make such a difference in these places. What we did for the, um, the EU funded this project is we actually rewrote the whole Turks and Caicos building code, which was decades out of date. And we did it in three months, participating with the local industry. And the reason we could do it so quickly is we had a good idea. We thought there's a really good building code called the IBC, the International Building Code. It's extremely fat and pretty impenetrable, even if you've been to Cambridge. But on the Turks and Caicos Islands, there's not many different types of buildings. They're all pretty straightforward. And so essentially what we did is we just pulled out the relevant bits of the, of the IBC and we wrote them down in the building code and we used the same font and the same format that they were used to so it didn't look like an alien, alien um, object when it arrived. And then we persuaded the EU that that wasn't good enough and that what we'd also like to do is produce a manual that explains in detail exactly how they should build things. And that's exactly what we did. Unfortunately, they hadn't got time to make, it hasn't had time to make a really significant difference until they got struck again. In Haiti, the situation was the worst that we've ever seen in the world. I have never seen such awful building standards. I think the view in Haiti before 2010 is that maybe concrete is like plasticine. Certainly a lot of it didn't have much reinforcement um, and columns were being made without any formwork at all. And so it's not surprising that Port-au-Prince came down and completely collapsed and brought the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere to a standstill. There was a frenzy of humanitarian agencies involved in Haiti um, and it was difficult to make a difference. But what we realized is what was missing was actually really very simple tools to help people make decisions quickly. Uh, this was one which is simply a matrix which relates the, um, the damage that a building sustained uh, to whether it's actually in a safe location. Uh, what was happening is people were trying to rebuild but forgetting that actually it really matters where you're rebuilding. Um, and it's really very, very simple things like that that can actually make an enormous difference um, on the ground. Nepal happened five years later, and I watched with dread as the news unfolded. Two of my colleagues went out to Nepal in the first week after the disaster struck. Their report came back and concluded, Kathmandu escaped a magic bullet. It was actually quite staggering how little damage there was in Nepal, given the size of the earthquake. But the thing that was really affected was the educational infrastructure. The official statistics the Monday after that earthquake said that 870,000 people, children, didn't have anywhere to go to school. It's worth pausing and reminding ourselves that that earthquake happened on a Saturday morning. And maybe if it had happened the day before, a large proportion of those 870,000 people might never have gone to school at all. The issue of building, school buildings getting damaged by hurricanes or falling down in earthquakes is actually an epidemic. We've been working with the World Bank for the last four years on the Global Programme for Safe Schools, which is trying to understand the underlying causes so that action can be taken to make things better. <coughs> One of the things that's needed is tools to rapidly assess whether buildings are damaged and need retrofitting or repairing. And in Nepal, we developed an app, which is all coded by local Nepalese IT com companies. My skills don't stretch that far, and I don't think anyone in my team does either. Um, but I realized the other day I was at an Arab meeting on digital transformation and was asked the question, are you doing anything digital? And I thought, well, actually, we are but I hadn't really thought about it particularly hard. But with the World Bank, we've been going to various places around the world, and the issue is both quantity and quality of schools. In Afghanistan, 20,000 schools need to be built by 2030. In Mozambique, the figure's 35,000, and that's because of the conflict. There was nothing built. Many of these kids are going to, going to lessons under trees or in, in really ramshackle buildings. And then countries like Armenia, 
are carrying a lot of risk because the legacy of the Soviet era, era and buildings weren't designed for earthquakes. Um, and in Indonesia, they've got huge numbers of schools spread out over all the islands. And the survey we did suggested that about 80% of those are vulnerable if there's an earthquake um, in Indonesia. You can't tackle these kinds of problems one by one. It's something that has to be dealt with systemically. Um, and so what we've been doing with the World Bank is just producing uh, different ways to think about this in terms of the characteristics of safe schools, how NGOs deal with safe schools, um, and roadmaps for donors so that the financing for schools actually addresses safety. The amazing thing at the moment is a lot of donor finance goes into school buildings. But the donors are interested in issuing loans. They're not necessarily interested in, in the outcome of those buildings. And that picture I showed you of a Nepal school was, in fact, a donor-funded schools program. And there were hundreds of them across Nepal. What I've been talking about <coughs> over the last uh, half an hour or so has really been a rapid journey through the last 30 years of my career. And the shifts that I've made from being thinking about structural engineering as simply something technical, something that was about designing amazing buildings, to realizing that actually it sits within the wider global context and sustainability really matters, both in terms of ecology and in terms of equity. And then the experience that I had in disaster situations, which is really about humanitarian engineering which is an emerging field which universities like Coventry and Warwick are championing. And there's an emerging global movement recognizing that actually what's needed in the world are engineers who are prepared to use their skills in different contexts and address some of these big issues and address them at scale. Where does that leave us in terms of going forwards? Someone asked me the other day, you've done so much, what are you going to do for the rest of your career? I paused for a second because I realized that Ove Arup was only one year older than me when he founded Arup. So clearly I have a great deal more to do. And having lunch with Jack Zuntz last week also reminded me that you don't retire at 65. You carry on for a great deal longer and can still offer an enormous amount in terms of your perspective, in terms of your knowledge, and in terms of your skills. So much is simply about passing on what you know. But I thought about it and was reminded of a quote by Stephen Hawking. He said that he thought the 21st century was going to be the century of complexity. Complexity is closely related to this concept of resilience that many of you are probably trying to get your head around. Complexity refers to complex systems that self-organize. They're not, they're not reductionist like the systems that we tend to, the, structure, the, the approach we tend to have to structures. And resilience has emerged, in my view, recently in the engineering world and the built environment world because we're beginning to realize two things. One is that everyone's living in cities and cities are really complex and it's increasingly difficult to build buildings in isolation. Mostly when we're building buildings, we're rubbing up against another building, or we're building a hospital which is part of a healthcare system. We're building a school which is part of an educational system. And it's what those systems do to serve society that actually really matters. The second thing is uncertainty. None of us really knows what the next 25 years look like. I realize that by 2050, I'm going to be the same age that my dad was when he died. My daughter, who's just gone to the University of Toronto to study maths, is going to be the same age I am now. On the one hand, 2050 seems a long way away. On the other hand, it's quite near. And I certainly plan to be around, even if some of you feel that you might not make it quite that far. But resilience is the capacity to survive adapt and thrive, whatever happens. I realize that it's in fact simply what I've been doing for the last 30 years, which is about reducing vulnerability and improving the quality of life 
so that people both survive and can thrive, whatever happens. And really, the difference is the whatever happens. And so the work that I've been doing in most recent years has been really focusing on this, trying to build communities that are stronger and better equipped for the future. In Pakistan, um, they, there was flooding in 2010, and then again in 2011, and then again in 2012. If you look at the official guidance in Pakistan, it says don't use earth construction in floodplains. But if you're extremely poor, do you have a choice? And so the reality in Pakistan is that people are building out of vernacular construction, which varies from burnt brink to adobe walls to layered mud. But no one has really spent time thinking about the science behind these construction technologies and how to make them safer. So perhaps when the next floods come along, uh, people um, will either their houses will either survive um, or they'll be able to build them back better. And this is an enormous research project that we're doing, funded by DFID, uh, with the International Office of Migration and many local partners. And we've surveyed 800 shelters, um, houses in Pakistan and it explored them in terms of all the things that I've been talking about this evening, in terms of their durability, in terms of their sustainability. We're reluctant to promote uh, construction out of charcoal burnt bricks when there aren't many trees left. Um, but also cost, because that's a massive issue, both for agencies helping, um, but also for families who are trying to fund these improvements themselves. 200,000 new homes were built or rebuilt after all of those flooding. And there was lots of experimentation into ways to make the construction better. But there was no proof, there was no science behind what was done. What we've done is we've actually drawn those solutions up. And then we've teamed up with a local university and come up with a very innovative way to actually load test these buildings. So in the bath, the bath was filled up with flood water, mimicking a flood. And then simply we videoed it until eventually, after a little while, the walls spontaneously collapse. And that mimics exactly the failure mechanisms that have gone on with these buildings. By understanding how they collapse, why they collapse, which ones collapse first, we're able to create guidance which enables people to make better informed decisions about what they build. Um, and it's not about codes of practice, it's just about empowering local families and empowering donors and agencies who have to make very difficult decisions about where to place their money. Many of you have seen this building. It's caused a lot of stir amongst the structural engineering community. Buildings don't spontaneously collapse that often, or so we think. I'm doing some work in Africa at the moment on urban risk, and I went to a seminar in Nigeria in January. There were representatives from about 11 countries there, and they were all presenting on urban risk. Seven of them cited structural collapse in their top five urban risks. So maybe the Rana Plaza collapsing in Dhaka wasn't so surprising. What was tragic is that 1,200 people died and 2,500 people were injured. About three months before, there'd been a major fire in a factory. And similar numbers of people had been injured and died. The consequence of all of this was an international media spotlight, which could have killed off the ready-made garment industry in Bangladesh. It could have also destroyed the reputation of some of the buyers, including household names like Zara, Calvin Klein, H&M, Tommy Hilfiger. But the ready-made garment industry in Bangladesh is too big to fail. It exports 31 billion's worth of goods each year, which represents 70% of the country's exports. And those clothes are made in nearly 4,000 factories that employ 4 million workers, and 60% of those workers are women. So the problem was much, much bigger than a structural collapse. It was actually the threat of an economy collapsing, which I don't think we've seen yet. We've seen cities collapse, like Detroit going bankrupt as a result of the economic downturn and over-dependency on the car industry 
but a whole country collapsing because of an industry failure was a new thing to, to, to think really hard about. And it, it's created unprecedented collaboration between the private sector, uh, the government, uh, international and local actors, who all came together in various alliances to try and solve the problem. I was working, reached out to the United Nations, the International Labour Organization, and said, you don't have the same amount of money as some of these um, uh, clothing companies who are employing Arab to develop the uh, damage assessment uh, process, but we'd like to give you this damage assessment process and help you survey the one and a half thousand factories that the government is directly responsible for. In the end, all 4,000 factories were surveyed, some by international firms like ours, but some of them, about one and a half thousand, were surveyed by local people who we trained up. It was fairly staggering how limited engineering education is in Bangladesh. And it was a real uphill struggle to train those people. But it was massively rewarding. The appreciation of those engineers, individuals who'd chosen to do engineering as a career and hadn't had access to the educational opportunities and continuing professional development opportunities that we all take for granted here. What's more, it gave them a job. And it gave them a reference, which to them is worth an enormous amount. The verdict from all those surveys was pretty poor. 64% of the factories required remedial works. Happily, there was only risk of about 2% collapsing. But that then posed a bigger problem, which is like, what do you do? And the United Nations was trying to help the government think about this. How on earth were they going to create the institutional capacity and the capacity within the construction sector to actually even carry out these remedial works. That's a massive problem. From my perspective, it wasn't as daunting as it might seem, and that's simply because of the amount of work that I've done in post-disaster situations. This scale of problem is not that, that different, really, to the school situation in Nepal, or the housing situation in Aceh after the tsunami. And what's happened in those types of places is that a special government department has been set up specifically to oversee those works. But importantly, those departments have actually left a legacy which has improved the construction industry in the country. That's what I was advocating for, uh, persuading the UN that it was possible and them in turn persuading the government that it was possible. And in the end, they came back to us to say, well, we've got the money and we've persuaded them, but how the hell do we do it? And over this year, we've helped them set up the remediation coordination cell, which brings together people from four government departments. And they've started the long process of engaging with factory owners and trying to make those factories safer. Some of them, of course, won't become safer. But those four million people whose livelihoods depend on them matter. And hopefully, by the work we're doing, We've not only improved structural safety, but we've also improved the quality of life for the people working in those factories. The final problem that I want to leave you with is simply the one of cities. I don't think it's talked about enough. This is a picture of Nairobi in Africa. Very few cities in Africa look like this currently. One, two, possibly three in most African countries outside South Africa. But the pace of urbanization in Africa and also in South Asia over the next 10, 20 years is nothing short of terrifying. I don't think even the Chinese could manage it. It's even faster than what's gone on in China. And the reality that we have to accept is that the buildings in those cities are actually not only defining the quality of the, the built environment and the physical environment, they're also determining the safety. And I don't like this picture particularly much, simply because I know that a large proportion of those buildings probably weren't designed for earthquakes, and Nairobi sits on the end of the Rift Valley. And that's knowledge that I make public every time I go to Nairobi, and they've just adopted the European code and are starting to create a national uh, annex for it. So there is progress, but it's slow. The reality, though, 
is that more and more people are going to be living in, in cities in conditions like this. The Sustainable Development Goals talk about upgrading all the slums and er eradicating poverty. I think it's a goal that's not achievable, and I think the better solution is to actually embrace the informality and focus on making these people's lives much more possible by helping them work towards getting decent shelter, access to water, and above all, livelihood opportunities so they can help themselves. And we're going to see more and more of this, unfortunately. When I first started showing this slide, which is the pictures of Bangkok floods in 2010, people felt that this wasn't the norm. But I think after Superstorm Sandy and then Hurricane Maria's devastation a few weeks ago, people are beginning to accept that this is the face of the future. And the structures we design may have very different purposes. We may be thinking about them as refuges from flooding rather than assuming we can make them resistant to flooding. All of this is really about city resilience. Unless we can make cities thrive resilient, which means that the individuals, communities, businesses within those cities can thrive and survive, we're not going to get very far. And the problem that the Rockefeller Foundation posed to me about four or five years ago is their strategy was they wanted to be able to measure resilience so that you could manage it because that would encourage people to take action. I suggested they had a problem because no one had actually worked out what city resilience was. And you can't measure it unless you know what it is. And I wasn't prepared to just take some under-researched view of city resilience off the shelf when so many people's lives depended on it. What we embarked on was a massive multidisciplinary research project. I felt like the conductor of an orchestra containing social scientists, engineers, economists, many of whom I was really struggling to understand and they certainly didn't understand each other. But what was really important is that we worked really hard to do so. We carried out research in six cities and we collaborated with 22 other cities to test our views along the way in order to ground truth what we were doing. The amazing thing that emerged from the research was that the same 12 things mattered in every single city. It didn't matter whether they were cities that were experiencing sudden shocks, like big flood events or earthquakes, or cities that had chronic stresses from crime or unemployment. It didn't matter whether they were cities like New Orleans in the Northern Hemisphere, or Cali in Colombia in the Southern Hemisphere. All of those 12 things mattered. Some of them mattered more or less than others, but they all mattered. So we came to a view that actually we could decide what city resilience was. And we have arranged those 12 things under four quadrants, which boil down to it, it, the things that matter are people, that everyone in the city has access to decent shelter, food, water, livelihood opportunities, and health care. If individuals don't have those things, they can't be resilient. And if they can't be resilient, communities can't be resilient and cities can't be resilient because there will always be failure. And as we know, as structural engineers, things fail because of the weakest link. But it's not just about individuals and households. It's also about how we organize ourselves in cities so that we act collectively and can live peacefully alongside each um, one another. And that's about fiscal management, it's about policing, it's about how crime and justice are dealt with. But it's also about community cohesion. And when I dug into this, I realized that structural engineers had a significant role to play in this too. How many of you have designed gazebos or pavilions or community centers, lightweight structures that actually bring people together and create social cohesion in societies? Some of the work that I do in Asia, that we're actually doing things like putting structures in parks to actually create a magnet so that people congregate and come together. The third quadrant, of course, is about leadership and governance and the importance of integrated planning and participatory planning. But the one that affects us most is about the infrastructure and the environment. It's about redefining what we do as engineers, whether we're structural engineers or civil engineers, it doesn't matter. But try thinking about what you do in terms of whether the structures you build and design protect, provide, or connect. Are you doing things that are actually protecting society, building dikes and dams, 
Using building codes, making sure buildings are safe. Are you perhaps designing pylons or aqueducts that are, that are essential for the provision of services? Or are you designing telecommunication towers and data centers, or roads bridges, or railway bridges that are ensuring the flow of goods, people, and knowledge, which actually make the world go round? The work we've done on this has been picked up by the 100 Resilient Cities program and is guiding resilient strategies in over 100 cities globally. I never believed when I started my career that I would ever have that much impact through the work that I do. It's extremely satisfying and I'm not assuming that everyone else wants to follow in my footsteps. But I do think it raises some important issues about thinking about what do we really do as structural engineers and what's the contribution we want to make over the next decades. So I'd like to take you back to the very beginning, to Ove's statement. He felt that our immediate priority was to satisfy the criteria for a sound, lasting and economical structure. On reflection, his criteria were pretty good. Sound structures make a real difference and need to be promoted, the importance of them needs to be promoted much more widely. I now translate lasting and economical into sustainable. It's about using the limited resources we have wisely, whether those are limited financial resources or limited environmental resources. But this doesn't go enough, far enough for me. I think as we move into the 2020s fairly shortly and head to 2050, we might think again about what our priorities are. And I suggest to you that our immediate priority as structural engineers is to not think about the outputs we're creating, but the outcomes associated with those structures. It's to use our knowledge and skills to contribute to safer, more sustainable, inclusive and resilient societies. It doesn't matter whether you're like me and choose to spend your career thinking about the most vulnerable and working on upgrading slums, or whether you're designing a bus shelter all of us can reduce vulnerability and improve the quality of life for others. Thank you.